You are welcome indeed. God bless you and good evening. I'm Pastor Swafford. Thank you so much for joining us tonight in our uh, what would typically be a Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, uh, So glad that you're able to tune in with us. I pray that all is well with you and that the Spirit of the Lord is moving in your life All of your needs are being met, and the Lord is truly, truly being glorified. Amen. Well, uh, as you know, most of you who stream our services, you know that on Sunday we had some technical issues, and our uh, Sunday worship service was not really aired. Uh, uh, I don't think there was any sound or or just some uh, technical issue. Hey, it didn't go over, okay? So what I'm going to be doing tonight and what would typically be a Bible study is that I am going to reteach that Sunday uh, a message, amen? And uh, uh, Reverend Glenn Hand will be picking up uh, 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 next Wednesday in the typical Bible study. So I want you to get your Bibles out. We're going to be in the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter number nine. Get your notepads for all of you uh, note takers, and we're going to get ready to get into the Word of God. Uh, Let's see, got one announcement uh, I want to share with you, and that is the National Day of Prayer. And uh, that's going to be coming up on your screen. It's going to be on uh, Zoom. And uh, 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 this coming Thursday, you see all of the information right there, uh, the meeting ID and passcodes and all of that good stuff. So uh, let's plan to uh, uh, join the intercessory prayer ministry who's hosting this. Uh, Let's join them in support and uh, uh, come out on Thursday and uh, pray. Amen. So that is all of the announcements that I have. And I do want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Reverend Glenn Hand. He has just been doing an outstanding job in Bible study, and it has truly, truly been a blessing to me, and it has helped me a lot. So uh, uh, thank you, Glenn. I truly, truly appreciate it. Well, let's get ready to get into the Word. I'm going to pray, and uh, uh, we'll get off and rolling. Amen? Amen. Bow with me, please. Our Father and our God, the hour has come that your word should go forth in power and in might. And Father, I am the first one to recognize just who the teacher really is, and that is your precious Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, teach us. Open up our hearts and our minds that we might receive the engrafted word of God, which is able to save us, which is able to change us, which is able to bring us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. For this, Lord, we say thank you. Father, we thank you for the authority that you've given us in your word. We exercise that authority right now by binding every devil, every demon, every foul, every hindering spirit. 
We declare this place, Bethel, the house of God. And we also declare it Bethlehem, the house of bread. So we thank you that there is bread in your house today that your children might eat in the name of Jesus Christ. Speak now to our hearts, O God. We listen in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, open up your Bibles. Go with me to Mark, Mark chapter number 9. And when you get there, just say amen, Mark chapter number 9. And, of course, our message is titled, Be Healed in Jesus' Name. We're still talking about healing. The people of God need to be healed. Be healed in Jesus' name. My objective in this teaching is to help the people of God receive their healing. To help the people of God. Healing is available to us. The Lord wants us healed. He wants us whole in our bodies. There are tons of scripture in the Bible that deals with healing and various ways in which people have been healed. Some are healed by medicine. Some are healed by miracles. Some are healed by just the immune system that God has put in our bodies. But God wants his people healed. He wants his people whole. And we've been talking about healing. And on uh, last Sunday, I believe, we kind of turned a little bit and we began to talk about the healing of uh, the mind mental healing, if you will. That requires healing also. And in dealing with that, we had to talk about the work of the, the demonic, demonic spirits and how they tend to attack the mind and cause us to be in need of mental healing. And such is the case here in Mark chapter number nine, a very interesting story we're all familiar with it. I've taught out of this many times. And uh, it amazes me that the Lord can show you things that you've never seen in a scripture that you've taught for years. So never think that you can exhaust the word of God. Never think that you can exhaust the scripture. Never look at a scripture and go, well, I got all of the revelations that I'm ever going to get out of that. No, I don't think so. Listen, uh, 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 there, there is no limit in the depth that God can take you in his word. And such is the case here. I learned a lot of things in uh, this story. And of course, we all know it as this young boy who was uh, 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 possessed, really, of a demonic spirit. And his father brought him to the Jesus' disciples to cast out this spirit, but they could not. So we're going to be dealing with that and dig into that thing in depth. So in Mark chapter number 9, let's, let me set it up this way. Now, in Mark chapter number 9, before we even start to read the scripture, realize something. Jesus was not there when this occurred. Jesus, along with Peter James and John, you remember they had gone up on the Mount of Transfiguration. This is where Jesus was transfigured. And uh, while uh, Jesus was there with those three disciples, the nine were left down below. And it was the nine disciples that ended up having to deal with this man in the boy that was uh, 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 demonically possessed. And uh, they tried to cast out the spirit. Uh, uh, the man came and he said that he, you know, he wanted them to cast out the spirit, but they could not. They couldn't do it. They could not cast out that spirit. And there they were standing there. They, they had been rebuking the devil. I can imagine them going, we cast you out in Jesus' name and nothing happened. Listen, as I've studied this, I, I, I realized that this particular spirit that they were dealing with is a very dangerous spirit. It is a very deadly spirit. I believe that it's probably one of the most deadly spirits that exists. Even Jesus said this kind. Even Jesus recognized the fact that 
This one is a little more difficult. This one is a little more challenging. He referred to it as this kind, this particular spirit. And to show you how wicked this spirit really is, this is a spirit whose ultimate aim is to kill and to destroy. And this spirit will even kill the very person that it's possessing. So it, that alone lets you know that you're dealing with an evil, wicked spirit. I believe that it is the same kind of spirit that, uh, uh, that gets into people and causes all these mass shootings, and the person ends up, what, shooting themselves after they done shot up everybody? That's the way that spirit functions. That's the way that thing works, and we got to learn how to get rid of it. The body of Christ has got to learn how to deal with this kind of spirit. So that's kind of the background of what's going on. The nine, the nine disciples had tried to cast out this spirit, this devil, this demonic spirit, and it went nowhere. And so now Jesus and the three disciples, Peter, James, and John, who were with him, they are now coming up on the scene. So let me read a little bit, beginning with verse 14. And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, when the people saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. That's the scene. So here is Jesus. Jesus comes upon the scene, and he finds the scribes there disputing with the nine disciples who had tried to cast out the Spirit. Now, when you study that, when you see where it says they were disputing with them, they were really kind of arguing with them. They were taunting these nine disciples. They were literally, they were laughing at them. As a matter of fact, the scribes were happy. They were glad that these disciples could not cast out that devil. And the reason that they were glad, because, you see, when they were unable to cast out the devil, you know, it, uh, 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 the, it would point to the ministry of Jesus. They were going, see, see, see there? You know, that's not all what it's cut out to be. It's not really validating the ministry of Jesus. These guys could not cast it out. And here is the thing. They should have been able to cast out this spirit. So they were standing there. Uh, 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 the scribes had been kind of laughing at them, these nine disciples. They were embarrassed, I'm sure. They're standing there. They're, they're shamed face, and they've been calling out the demonic spirit, and the demonic spirit didn't go anywhere, and they're just standing there, and they don't know what to do. And then all of a sudden, they look up. Here comes Jesus. Oh, I bet they were so excited, so happy to see Jesus comes on, come on the scene. And it's just like us. Have you ever had a situation in your life? You ever been in a place, in a circumstance where things were not going well? You didn't know what to do. Things were not working the way that you thought they should be working. And then all of a sudden, Jesus shows up. And that's what happens here. These nine disciples, they look up, they see Jesus. I would imagine they're going, oh, praise God. Jesus now comes on the scene, and he says to the scribes, what are you discussing with them? He asked that question. And then the scribes, before they could even answer, the man or the father of this boy speaks up, and he says, I brought to you my son who has a mute spirit. And uh, he wanted them to cast it out, but they could not. 
He said, I brought to you my son. He has a mute spirit. And that word mute, a better translation there is dumb, a dumb spirit. Because later on, you'll see where even Jesus calls it a deaf and a dumb spirit. So he had a dumb spirit. And that word dumb there means dull of hearing. It means dull of speech. The young boy who had the mute spirit, that spirit caused him to not be able to speak or not be able to speak properly. He couldn't hear. He couldn't hear properly. That's why it was called a a dumb spirit. And then one of the things that made me kind of stop and think, I went, how did this man know what kind of spirit his son had? He identified it as a mute spirit, which is a dumb spirit. And as I started to research, I found that uh, 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 dumbness in Scripture had several causes. There were several causes of dumbness in Scripture. And let me give them to you. One was this. One was due to physical defect physical defect. In other words, the, uh, 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 the inability to speak, the inability to hear, it wasn't caused by a demonic spirit, but it was a physical defect, something physical going on in that body that caused that. For example, you take somebody that has autism or they are on the spectrum to some degree it doesn't mean they have a demonic spirit. No, not at all. That is something physical. That is a physical defect in the body. So that was one of the ways that it was used. Another one was this, psychological fear or a feeling of inferiority in not knowing how to express oneself. Psychological fear or a feeling of inferiority in not knowing how to express oneself. Let me give you an example of that, a couple of examples. You remember Daniel, over in the book of Daniel, when Daniel had that vision, when the angel came on the scene, Michael, the archangel, came on the scene, you know what the Scripture says, that Daniel was speechless, He couldn't speak because of the overwhelming presence, because of the presence of this angel, which represented the glory of God. He was speechless. Another example would be the psalmist, David. When he talked about the presence of the Lord, David himself said, I was mute. I was dumb. In other words, the presence of the Lord is so overwhelming, and it could be that same way with us. The presence of the Lord comes upon you. You experience his presence, and there are no words that you can say. You know, you, you're, you're mute. There, you're, you're speechless because of the presence of the Lord. Another uh, uh, reason for it, another cause for dumbness was a uh, temporary judgment from God. Temporary judgment from God. Dumbness was the result of a a temporary judgment from God. Good example would be our man, Zechariah. You remember him? uh, The one who had been where he was in the temple and the angel came and said, Zechariah, your prayers have been answered. And, you know, at this point, Zechariah is going, you know, Lord, I'm an old man and that sort of thing. And and the angel said, look, you can be dumb. The angel caused dumbness to come upon Zechariah, and it was a temporary dumbness. And it was the judgment of God. And then finally, and this is the one that we're looking at today, uh, it's an oppression of an evil spirit. An oppression of the evil, an evil spirit that caused this dumbness to come upon a person. Now, note something there. Uh, where was it? Where did I see that? Uh, uh, this is when the man was talking to Jesus, and he's telling Uh, Jesus, the condition of his son, what was happening with him. And he says, wherever it seizes him, wherever it 
seizes him. That word seize there means to lay hold of in such a way that you own it. Wherever it seizes him, wherever it takes over him, takes to- in other words, take total control of him as if he owned this boy. He's mine. This, now think about that. Here is a demonic spirit saying, he's mine. I own him. I control him. And there are some people in that same situation where they are practically owned and controlled by a demonic spirit. That word seize means also to overtake one, to come upon them and overtake them. Now, you know, when I looked at this and studied this, I realized that the condition of this boy was such that this spirit would only cause these things to happen every now and then. It wasn't something that was going on like 24 hours a day. You know, the spirit had him, but from time to time, this spirit would cause this boy to to fall down, get thrown down, uh, 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 gnashes his teeth, becomes rigid, foaming at the mouth. Now, and I want to deal with those because when you look at those things, that guy gave, uh, told Jesus four things that was really happening to his son. And when you look at those four things, they are figurative of things that happen in people who are possessed by this spirit today. And, you know, I believe that this spirit really works strong in young folks, youth, teenagers. We really have to uh, uh, be on guard, have to keep our eyes open to be able to recognize this because he works this in them. Now, listen to this. Remember, all of those things that happened to that boy, they are figurative of what happens to some today. The first thing that he says that happened to his son is what? He throws him down, throws him down. What happens when you're thrown down? When you're thrown down, you're off track. When you're thrown down, there's no forward progress. When you're thrown down, you, you, you lose your bearings. You're, you're not making any kind of progress, no kind of progress in life. Just being thrown down. Have you ever looked at somebody and you wonder, why aren't they moving? Why aren't they going forward? Why aren't they making any kind of progress in life? Why are they not uh, uh, on track as it pertains to normalcy of life? They've been thrown down, thrown down by a demonic spirit, and we've got to recognize it for what it is. The second thing that he said was what? Foams at the mouth. Foams at the mouth. Now, that would be figurative of how one speaks, what comes out of their mouth. It speaks of vulgar speech, cussing. You know, you, you've seen people that just, you listen at them, and you're going, good Lord. You hear the vulgar speech. You, you hear the cussing. Uh, lying is uh, 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 another, another symptom of that. Lying, being disrespectful, constant criticism. These are all things which speaks of a speech, if you will, a foaming at the mouth, just like this young boy. And then thirdly, he said what? gnashes his teeth. The gnashing of the teeth, it speaks of intense anger, intense anger. You ever see anybody like that? And they're just angry, just outburst of anger. You know, they could be just perfectly fine at one time. And then all of a sudden there's this violent outburst and you go, whoa, where where, where did that come from? This kind of spirit does that. All of a sudden, they were calm and everything was normal, but now they're in a fit of rage. This dumb spirit, this deaf and dumb spirit, that's what he does. And finally, he says he becomes rigid. Rigid means stiff, unbending, unyielding. In other words, I looked at that and I said that, you know, when someone is unyielding, unbending, it's, you can't tell them anything. My mind is set. I know what I want to do. I'm really not listening to you or anybody else. I'm just rigid. I'm unbending. I'm unyielding. 
and you can't tell me a thing. Listen, these are things that comes with this particular spirit. So after this man lays out to Jesus what has been happening to his son, let me pick it up here in verse number 19. He answered him and said, now this is Jesus, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. It's almost like there's a level of frustration that Jesus had. Jesus is like, he's getting on all of their cases now. He says, O faithless generation, O unbelieving generation, generation. How long shall I be with you? How long do you think I'm going to be around? How long shall I bear with you? This is what Jesus is saying. Oh, faithless generation. Oh, unbelieving generation. How long shall I be with you? When are you going to be in a place where you can stand on your feet and just move by the word that you've heard and seen in me? When are you going to stand up? When are you going to grow up? When are you going to walk in what I've been teaching? How long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? He said, bring him to me. Now, let me read on. Look at this in verse 20. Then they brought him to him, brought the boy to Jesus. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming at the mouth. Now, this is so interesting here. They brought this boy who has this demonic spirit. Can't you just see him pulling and dragging this boy? And they brought this boy in front of Jesus. And when the spirit saw Jesus, not, not the boy, the spirit in the boy, the spirit oppressing this boy saw Jesus And when he saw Jesus, that spirit went into a rage. That spirit began to convulse in that boy. And the reason that spirit did that, he saw Jesus and he knew, I got to go. He saw Jesus and he knew, my time is up. He saw Jesus and he knew, I can no longer live here. I can no longer oppress and possess this young boy. I have got to go because I see Jesus. But before I go, I'm going to cause as much damage, cause as much destruction as I possibly can in this boy. And this spirit went into this rage trying to just do damage to this boy knowing that he's got to leave. Now, that shows you how how dangerous this spirit really is. You know, when uh, uh, we'll see that when uh, uh, Jesus calls this spirit out, he's going to practically almost kill this boy. Let me read on a little bit. Now, the boy is just having a fit. He's wallowing on the ground, foaming at the mouth. And look at verse 21. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, uh, from childhood, and uh, often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. Now, let me stop here. Here's Jesus. Jesus said, uh, how long has this been going on? I mean, here this boy is. He's, he's on the ground. He's waddling. He's foaming and t- at the mouth. And Jesus asked the father, how long has this been going on? Now, remember, Jesus never asked a question because he's seeking some information. There's some information that he doesn't know, so he's asking a question. No, when Jesus asks a question, he's using that question to draw something else out. Jesus is looking for something else. He's trying to do something else. Jesus is now trying to reach this father. Jesus is now trying to uncover a weakness, if you will, in the Father. So he begins to get the Father to talk. He says, how long has this been happening to him? And of course, the Father responds, from childhood. So, you know, this has been going on for quite a while. 
since the boy was a young child. He could very well have been in his teens, young adult at this time, but this has been going on for a while. And then the man even goes as far as saying, you know, and this thing has tried to throw him in the fire and in the water to destroy him. You see, and again, that shows you how deadly this spirit is, that it would destroy the very body that it's living in. Throw it in the fire, you'll get destroyed in a fire. Throw it in the water, you can be destroyed in the water. Now, look at this. He says, trying to destroy him. Now, now note this carefully. He says, but if, I like that if, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Now, this man is talking to Jesus. He said, if, if you can do anything, he's talking to Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords, the great I am, the lily of the valley, the bright and the morning star. He's talking to Jesus. He's talking to the creator of the universe. He's talking to the very one who stood out on nothing and said, let there be light, and there was a light. He's talking to the one that divided the light from the day, and he called the light day and the darkness night. In the evening and in the morning was the first day. The creator of all things, he's saying, if, if you can do, if, if you can do anything, have compassion on us. Now, one thing you can say about this man, note that he, he did not say, have compassion on my son. Have compassion on him. The man said, have compassion on us. It's like he didn't separate himself from his son. It's almost like, listen, we're in this together. This is my son, and I love my son. Have compassion on us. This affects all of us. This affects our entire household. Have compassion on uh, us. And that's a good mindset, I believe, that we should have. Because if we lose compassion, if we lose compassion for the one who is going through this, and we lose that compassion because we don't recognize what it is, it's like, uh, 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 you know, Lord, fix him. I, I, I'm okay. Get him away from me. You know, we want to separate ourselves from it. But this man was not willing to separate himself from his son. He said, have compassion on us. Now, look at how the Lord uh, uh, deals with this in verse 23. And Jesus said to him, now I'm going to just read it the way the scripture says, and then we're going to come back and talk about it. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Now, we need to look at some things here. Note this. The word believe there is not in the original text. So it would read like this. Jesus said to him, if you, if you can. Now, uh, 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 the, uh, the translators, bless their heart. God love them. We thank God for those folks who, who have the uh, 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 skill and uh, they've been blessed to be able to translate Scripture. But sometimes the translators hurt us instead of helping us because uh, 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 this is not really a good translation because this is really reading something like this. Jesus said, if you can. What do you mean? Are you serious? If you can, talking about me, if I can, and then he kind of turns the table a little bit and says, listen, all things are possible to him who believe. All things are possible to him who believes. He's getting this man, getting this boy's father to look at his own belief to look at where he is as far as believing is concerned. And in verse 24, immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. He cries out. Jesus gets to the heart of the problem. He says, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. You know, that speaks to so many people. It speaks to so many of us. It speaks to so many Christians who believe, 
But yet there is a part of our being that does not believe. There is a part of our being that struggles with it. And, and, and we could say the same thing. Uh, I believe, but Lord, help me in the area of my unbelief. And a lot of times we don't like to look at our unbelief, but we need to deal with our unbelief because, listen, our unbelief gives the devil a foothold. Our unbelief gives the devil a way in. He can't come in. He, listen, he don't come in through our belief. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm strong here. I'm strong in this area. But no, he wants to find that place where you're weak. He wants to find that place where you are not believing. And this is what, the, what Jesus brings out of this man, that he uncovered areas of unbelief. And we need to allow the Lord to shine the light of his countenance. And you'll hear me say this all the time in communion. Shine the light of your countenance on anything in me that's not like you. That area of unbelief, Lord, get rid of it. Forgive me of it. Cleanse me of it. And this is what Jesus brings out, that there is a level of unbelief in uh, this man. Now, look at this, verse 25. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit and said to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. So all of a sudden, the crowd is coming up on them. Uh, obviously, they had moved away, moved to the side. They were alone, but now the crowd is coming up on them, and Jesus thought, well, let me just get rid of this spirit. And so uh, uh, he rebuked the spirit. He commanded the spirit to come out of the boy and to enter him uh, no more. And then look at this. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him, and he became as one dead, so that many said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. So when Jesus cast out that spirit, remember this spirit is going to try to do as much destruction as possible because he knows he's got to come out. He knows he's got to leave, and he's trying his best to kill this boy. The spirit leaves. Jesus takes the boy, takes the boy by the hand, and he raises him up, and that spirit is gone. And so thus kind of ends the commotion. You can kind of see the crowd is now breaking up and people going their separate ways. This boy has been healed. He has been healed because this demonic spirit has been cast out. Now, let me read on. Look at verse 28. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? Now, good question. I mean, these disciples, uh, they wanted to know. They wanted, Lord, why could we not cast it out? Why is it, why, why is it, Lord, we, we did what you taught us to do why could we not cast it out, particularly when you've given us power to cast out spirits? Now, I want you to hold your place right there in Mark 9 and go over to Mark chapter number 3. Look at this, Mark 3. You don't have to turn far. Mark 3, and go with me to verse 14. Verse 14, then he appointed 12. These are the 12 disciples that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have power, now note that, have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons. Now, I wanted you to see that. This is when Jesus was sending out the 12. He was sending them out to preach, sending them out to do the work of the Lord. 
and they were given power. They were given power to heal sicknesses. They were given power to cast out demons, and all of a sudden, they come up on a demon, and they cannot cast it out. Have you ever ran across a situation like that? Have you ever ran across a situation where you could not do what the Word of God said you could do? That you could not do what the Word of God had already given you power to do, and it didn't work. And they wanted to know why. Why could we not cast it out? Let let me give you some things here, some problems. And one of the problems was this. It was how they viewed their power, how they viewed the power that they had. They looked at the power, these nine, they looked at this power, probably the other three also, they looked at this power as some kind of magical type power, something that you carry around with you, almost like a a, a magic wand. Almost, It's almost like if I just say the right words, uh, abracadabra, or, you know, say something and then uh, things will change. And it, listen, it don't matter what you say. You can even say in the name of Jesus, if you are not viewing that power properly, if you aren't understanding it properly and knowing how that works, that's not going to happen even if you say, in the name of Jesus. So we got to know how to look at the power that we have been given. It's not just something that we play with. This is something awesome. Listen, another problem that they had is that there had been no preparation of the heart and the spirit. There had been no preparation of their hearts and of their spirits. Listen, and this applies to all of us, all who work in ministry, all who are called by the name of the Lord. Whenever you get ready to do the work of the Lord, there has got to be a preparation of the heart, a preparation of the spirit. You don't just go out and jump into these things. My heart has got to be prepared. My spirit has got to be prepared. That's why it's good to get up in the mornings and get into the presence of the Lord uh, before you start to start your day, and particularly before you start ministry. You don't want to get out here trying to rebuke devils, and there has been no preparation of uh, the heart, because this spirit, this deaf and dumb spirit is quick to discern, uh, listen, the lack of moral power. Let me say that again. This spirit This deaf and dumb spirit is quick to discern the lack of moral power. You've probably never heard me say that before, moral power. We got to talk about that, moral power. And that spirit would yield to no other. That spirit will only yield to moral power power. And I'll talk about that because these nine disciples who were standing up here and they're trying to cast out this demonic spirit with no preparation of heart, no telling what's going on in their hearts. They're not really viewing the power that they have properly and realize who was with them. One of the persons who was with them was Judas. Judas was one of the nine. Judas was standing there with them. No doubt it was Judas also up there calling out the devil. That spirit probably looked at them and going, are you serious? Listen, moral power, moral authority, walking right and talking right. Now, listen to this. The Lord tied our power and authority to our morality. Let me say that again. The Lord tied our power. He tied our authority to our morality. 
Listen, the power of God is so awesome. He just doesn't give it to you to just let you go and use it frivolously. The Lord wants to make sure that this thing is channeled properly so and dealt with properly, handled properly, so he tied our power, that power that he gave us. When the scripture says, lo, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the devil, he gave us that power. You know, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead That's the same power that he gave us. The power that he used in creation, that's the same power that he gave us. So he thought, let me tie that power to your morality. Now listen to this. Divine power flows through the conduit of morality. Divine power flows through the conduit of morality. Listen, when divine power is released, power to cast out demons, it flows through the conduit of your morality. That's why you got to be walking right and talking right. Listen, receiving power is one thing, but releasing power is something else. Listen, I can receive it by just standing there and receiving it. Let it fall on me. Let me have it. Baptized in the Holy Ghost, I've received that power. But now releasing the power is a whole different thing. I release it through my morality. In other words, I, I, I release it through what the Lord has taught me to walk in Listen, their failure, the reason the morality wasn't there is uh, 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 because of a lack of prayer. Look at this. Look at verse 29. So he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer. And your Bibles probably say and fasting, but and fasting is not in the original text. So what Jesus is saying here. This kind comes out by nothing but prayer. They could not release power because they lacked prayer. They couldn't release power because they lacked the prayer. Listen, church, no prayer, no power. No prayer, no power. Now, now why is that? Listen, when you pray, Something happens when you pray. When you pray, and the more you pray, it strengthens your own morality. Because when you pray, you get closer to the Lord. And as you get closer to the Lord, he shines the light of his countenance upon you. And it highlights anything in you that's not like him. And as you see it, you you clean yourself off, and you dust yourself off, and you get closer to him. And the more you pray, the closer you get. The more you pray, the more morality that you start to walk in. You're getting closer to the Lord. That's why, listen, uh, uh, they needed to pray. And when you pray, that's what happens when you pray. Yes, you're praying for other people, and you're praying for other things, but even as you're praying, you see yourself. As you're praying, when you see yourself, you see things in your life that need to be changed. And when you change them, you are walking in the things of God. When you change them, you are walking in the Spirit. Uh, 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 Paul put it this way. When you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of uh, the flesh. And so when I do that, then... I'm walking in the morality of the word of God. And when I'm walking in the morality of the word of God, it gives divine power a conduit to flow through. And when divine power flows, you know what? Healing occurs. When divine power flows, things change. When divine power is flowing through morality, 
things uh, change. People get healed. Situations change. When that divine power is flowing, listen, you can just walk in a room and demons flee. Demons will flee. You all have often heard me uh, uh, share this story about the, uh, my, my mother. Listen, we grew up, when I was a kid, we grew up, we had dogs. We had real dogs. We had the dogs that stayed outside. You know, it's not like the dogs of the day. Our dogs stayed outside. And every now and then, when my mother was not around, we'd let our dog in the house. And the dog loved being in the house. He'd be in there laying down with us, watching TV. But you know what? Something would happen. When my mother walked in the room, that dog would look up. It's like, all right, see y'all, I got to go. That dog would immediately walk out of that house just because of her presence. She didn't have to say anything. She didn't have to say, get out of here. That dog would just simply get up. All right, she's here. I got to go. That's the way it should be with demonic spirits. Listen, we should be so close to the Lord, so close to him, walking in the things of God that when we come on the very scene, demons fear. That when we come on the scene, that the atmosphere change when you show up because you bring the divine power of the Lord flowing through the conduit of your morality, and people are healed, and people are changed. Amen. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, we praise you, we worship you. Thank you for this time in your word. I pray, O oh Lord, that your word has been seed, seed sown on good ground, and that it touches the hearts and minds of people. And now that uh, uh, if there are those out here now and you're viewing this broadcast under the sound of my voice and you want to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you want to be saved, you want to be a child of God, and it's easy to become a child of God. There's a prayer that you pray, and this prayer is going to come up on the screen. And uh, uh, you just pray this prayer, and, uh, uh, and it goes something to the effect of, uh, 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 Lord, I, I confess the fact that, uh, you know, that I've sinned and I've fallen short of the glory of God. And I believe that uh, uh, Jesus died for me and uh, uh, he was raised from the dead. If you confess that, if you believe that, then you're saved. You're, you're a child of God. And I welcome you to the body of Christ. Amen. And I would recommend that if you've given your life to the Lord, then find yourself a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church where you can continue to grow in the things of God, learn the ways of God, that you might walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen. Well, God bless you all. Uh, 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 it's been exciting. It's been a privilege to be able to share this with you. And uh, uh, I do want to take this opportunity also to thank you for your uh, continued financial support for the returning of the tithe, giving of the offering, and sowing alms. Uh, we need your financial support if we're to take the ministry out and to do the things that the Lord called us has called us to do. And there, there's a lot of work to be done, so we need help and support. So I want to thank you for that. I want to thank all of you who are, you know, now that we're back, church is open, you all, and uh, 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 we need help in various ministries. So I would encourage you to uh, uh, get involved, find a place uh, that you can work and uh, we can do what the Lord has called us to do. Amen. Well, uh, I believe that's it. I'm here with Joy. Joy, is there anything that I've left out? All right. Well, to God be the glory, I'm going to just uh, 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 have another word of prayer, and we'll, we'll close it out. Bow with me. Father, we thank you and we praise you. Uh, thank you for this time together in your word. We ask now that as we depart from this place, but of course, never from your presence, that you would be with us, uh, uh, lead us and guide us. Give us all a good night's rest and wake us up refreshed in the morning, prepared to see another day. And we will be so careful to give you all the praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Well, amen, amen again, and I'll see you all in church on Sunday. Take care, everybody.
Thank you for joining today's broadcast. Please visit us on our website at rolcm.org.